<laughs> Mickey Rourke, he didn't like the idea of rehearsal. Faye Dunaway, she was ready to rehearse as much as possible, and I wanted to rehearse because when you are on a tight schedule like that, it's much better if you have rehearsed. But uh, no, so we had to do without it, and I guess he wanted to stay fresh. Well, how could Mickey Rock portray Hank? It's an impossibility. Why didn't they get some old duffer? They wanted Mickey Rook to be uh, Humphrey Bogart and pick up girls in the bar. Hank wasn't like that, really. I remember there were some really beautiful girls in there, which weren't at all the kind of girls that Hank went after. He went after people who were slightly damaged. He really overdid it, you know, the hair hanging down. And I don't think the kids ever been on Skid Row, you know. It's when the guy walks in, he says, Oh, I've been missed. I should run for mayor. I didn't get it right. Because I'd walk in, I'd say, Oh, I've been missed. I guess I should run for mayor. So you don't brag it. Mm. It's low-key all the time. He had it all kind of exaggerated, uh, untrue, a little bit show-off about it. So, uh, no... It was kind of misdone. I found out that Hollywood is more crooked, dumber, crueler, stupider than all the books I've read about it. They didn't go deeply enough into how it lacks art and soul and heart, how it's really a piece of crap. There are too many hands directing, there are too many fingers in the pot and they're all kind of ignorant about what they're doing. They're greedy and they're vicious. So you don't get much of a movie. I never got to meet him whilst I was reading him. It was only later, after a really drunken night with Sean Penn, back in my house in Dublin, talking uh, stupid rhymes, really. And found out that he was a great fan of Hank's. And I said, you know, he's a, he's a friend of mine. And he's, he's, no. I said, yeah. He was reciting you know, some of Hank's verse and, and, and me back to him. And he got up, excused himself to make a phone call. He said, hey, kid. Where the hell are you? I said, well, I'm over here. And I'm with Bono. He says, oh, I'm not. I said, ask Linda. He says, who's Bono? Turns out that Hank's old lady had been to every U2 show uh, since we came, since we were like kids, like garage band. She'd been to every one of them. She'd been to more U2 shows than I'd been to. Linda's back on saying, you know, if you guys play out here, we want to come. Well, sure enough. Invited them down, invited the two of them down when we next played Los Angeles. Not ever thinking they would come. But they did come. <laughs> I think it was fascinating to him that the world had come to, you know, this wasn't a political rally, this was musicians on stage and this many people and this kind of fandom and this, all of a sudden in the middle of the show, ah, he says, he comes to the microphone and says, this is for Charles and Linda Bukowski. And I think we got to the old fucker uh, because, uh, you know, he, I think we might have moved him a little bit. The crowd went crazy. They knew who he was and he was taken off guard. You know, he really was. And he got emotional, I think. And he and Linda danced to the song again. Bukowski was fortunate enough to see in his own lifetime his own work be translated into, I don't know, God knows how many languages to make him more than a comfortable living and to go out in, you know, 30 or 40 printings. And, you know, that's a very rare thing for a poet. If he hadn't made any money, and yet he had been able to do all the writing, that would have been enough for him. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And he would have worked in a candy store if he had to, or shining shoes, or he would have stayed at the post office and retired on some piddly-ass little thing. I'm afraid I have to agree with John William Corrington and his prediction which he made in, what, 1962? He was totally right.
he said, by the end of the century, Bukowski will be known as the guy who liberated poetry from the clutches of the academics and did what Wordsworth was attempting to do and what Rimbaud actually did. You know, this is the company that he put him in in 62 when nobody had heard of him. Are you afraid of death? No. How, how old would you like to be? It, it's not a matter of how old you can become, how long you can go having all your moxie. Mm -hmm. So I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. So I think my light is dwindling now. You know, I went to the track today. I came back from the track. I looked down. And I had on one black shoe and one brown shoe. <laughs> so I said, even though I won $212 betting the horses, I looked down and I said, the light is dwindling, old boy. He continued to lessen the amount of alcohol intake over the years, even though he, that meant he had to be less than his myth. I think he found a kind of confidence in himself, of course, when he became successful. And that took away a lot of the uh, psychological pressure that had been on him for so many years. He didn't need to react so much. He knew that he was a cause of goodness and that he could be a cause of goodness. And um, I don't think he felt that way about himself in the past, in his early years or in his mid-years even. And by the time he got to Last Night of the Earth poems, he's really a wise man and a very thoughtful man and, and was not afraid to be vulnerable. He was uh, turning the, the ball around in front of you and let you see as many sides as he could see himself. There's a thing called the new formalism. And there's a little group of people called the new formalists. And they want to go back to sonnets and, you know, poetry at its most structured. And to me, it's exactly the wrong way poetry should be headed. Oh, this is a little New Year's greeting that we did called Art, and it's one of his greatest poems. It's just one word above the other. As the spirit wanes, the form appears. As an artist or a poet or anybody loses the spirit that first brought them into whatever they do, as that wanes, they do get more concerned with form and try to cover up the fact that they're not writing as well anymore by writing formal work. Pulp dedicated the bad writing. That just is the Bukowski story right there. Not that he wrote badly, but that he took chances. That was an older man's novel, and yet it's so filled with a younger man's inventiveness and suppleness. Hollywood got it L.A., let's say, from this way, and Pulp got it L.A. this way, right? And Ham and Rye got in L.A. this way. Think about it. And then the short stories came on L.A. that way. And then the poems rushed down the freeway this way. You know, it was that ruined landscape of Los Angeles that he wrote about. Pulp, of course, is a pure fantasy. It isn't the real life Bukowski. So a fantasy, though, is the life of the mind. So it was something that was always on his mind. The man was dying. He was nearing the end of his life. And he writes about Lady Death. That's how he dealt with his dying to make art out of it. 